reading that. I liked how your translation said that he saw that Peter wasn't in line with the gospel. Uh, the passage, the translation that is on the screen that I'm reading, talks about him not being in step with the gospel. And uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's the same words to express the same idea of being lined up with the gospel. Uh, his, his conduct wasn't in step with the truth of the gospel. And that's going to be the, the main point of this sermon this morning is uh, considering our conduct being in step with the truth of the gospel. And as we're going verse by verse through this letter of Paul's to the Galatians, um, it occurred to me this week, th- you, you could also preach this letter effectively by uh, going, you know, covering like the whole book in a sermon. Like there are parts of the sermon today uh, that may be a little unclear, but gets clarified much l- more in chapters to come. And so I encourage people to be reading the book of Galatians. It only takes uh, a few minutes to read the entire letter to the Galatians. And uh, if you're praying, asking the Lord to teach you, and you're reading through this letter, the Lord will show you and teach you things, and, and it will give more clarity to the details that I'm preaching on. And uh, I believe it will be a blessing to you if you keep reading through the whole book and become more and more familiar with it. And you'll see more connections from the front to the end. When Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, I don't think that they uh, went through it um, over a course of, of 10 weeks. Initially, they, I'm sure they sat down and read the whole letter. And they read it a number of times. Maybe they read it three or four times in a row, just receiving this important letter, recognizing that it's God's word. But then... Later on, I'm sure they spent weeks and weeks thinking about it and looking at parts of it and meditating on it. And so that's how we're doing it, but I also encourage you to read through it piece by piece as well. So remembering where what's going on in this letter, uh, there seemed to be some people that went to the Galatians and were starting to teach them something added to the gospel, or they changed the gospel, they twisted the gospel a little bit. We saw in chapter 1 that, Uh, Paul said, if anyone comes and preaches anything, even if it's an angel from heaven, that's not the gospel we preach to you, then let them be accursed. So the Galatians had someone coming that changed the gospel or twisted it just a little bit. He talked about the gospel being uh, distorted um, or added to, um, and he also talked about a different gospel. And so... uh, this is what the, the Galatians were going through. And whoever was coming to them was claiming an authority to say, hey, look, we, you need to listen to us about this matter. And um, Paul was not only saying, don't add to the gospel, but he was confirming, I have been commissioned by Jesus himself to give you this very specific message. It can't be changed. And so he's also defending his own um, authority as Jesus' apostle. And in the passage that Rod read, he's continuing, and he's, he starts to do both, where he's continuing to show, look, I have an authority from Jesus Christ that is not connected, that does not come from the apostles, but comes from Jesus and places me beside the other apostles. And so he shows that by showing, telling the story of how he opposed Peter. Uh, Peter goes by the name Peter or Cephas, or Simon Peter, and here he refers to him as Cephas. And so he's not only showing, look, I have an authority from Jesus to preserve the gospel, even if one of the other apostles have contradicted it. And he said, if I or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel, don't listen to it. And here he's showing Peter, he wasn't preaching another gospel with his voice, but with his actions. And so Paul is saying, look, I... As an apostle, I can confront Peter. But he's also uh, showing, he's, he not only in this passage is he showing that he had the authority to confront Peter, but he's also clarifying that gospel message. And he's, he's underscoring the importance of the message and how we are to receive it. How we're not only to believe it, but to conduct our lives in step with it. And uh, the gospel as he went over in the beginning, is that Christ died and rose again as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's by faith in that 
in Jesus' death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven, our sins are washed away, and we're made clean and pure before the Lord and can expect mercy on the judgment day. So that's the gospel. That's so far what Paul has been doing. And now when we look, he, uh, in the immediate context, he had just said, remember, I got commissioned, and then I didn't go to Jerusalem to the religious hub, but I went to Arabia. And then years later, I went to Jerusalem. And now he's saying, now, Cephas went to Antioch. So he says, uh, we'll go ahead and read it. Uh, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So what's going on here is Peter went to Antioch. He was eating with Christians. And then these uh, men from James came and joined them. And that's most certainly Jews from Jerusalem who were followers of James. And I don't think that the apostle James was uh, was encouraging his disciples to act in this way. I think as you read his letter um, and him being an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was trying to change them as well, but they, uh, they weren't following their shepherd well. But they came down to Antioch, and they gave pressure to Peter to separate himself from these Gentiles. Um, and Peter did this in fear of the circumcision party. So this is a term that gets used in the Bible. Whenever you're reading through the New Testament and you read about circumcision, you've got to read the context and understand. Sometimes it's talking about the Jews. Sometimes it's talking about true Christians. P Paul talks about, he says, you are the true circumcision. In Ephesians, he talks about that. Sometimes he's talking about, the. it's a, it's a word to to represent the law. So you just got to read it in context. And here, he's talking about the circumcision party. So that means this group of people who still held to the law, and they gave it too much importance, the Old Testament law. And the only way that the Old Testament law can have too much importance is if it starts affecting the gospel and twisting the gospel. Now, the gospel is throughout the Old Testament law, if they could understand it correctly. And uh, Paul teaches it to, to us, Peter did it as well, and Jesus did it. So there is a way to understand the law in the light of the gospel, but these men, they didn't do that. They thought, uh, they, they, they saw it in a different light. And so Peter is eating with Christians, followers of Jesus, and then these Jews show up, and he separates himself, and he starts eating with only the Jews. And the reason why he was doing that is because in the past, the Jews were required by the law to stay ceremonially clean. And if somebody else out there was not clean and they were ate with them or they touched them, they became unclean. And then they had to offer sacrifices and do different things to be made clean again. Now, the law never labeled an entire people group unclean. It didn't say these Gentiles are unclean. But because of all the things they did, they became unclean. Um, and one of the primary things was eating unclean food, that the Bible had listed pork products and shellfish, and certain animals were unclean, and the Gentiles ate them, and uh, so they became unclean. But in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, Jesus, while he was alive, before he died and rose again, he was teaching about clean and unclean, and uh, Mark tells us that Jesus declared all food clean. And Peter himself received a vision where Jesus told him, there is no unclean food. And so if there's no unclean food, and some Gentile is eating this food that used to be unclean, well, then a person can't be unclean by being with this person anymore. Jesus declared all food clean. And in doing that, he just said a person can't become unclean through, what's, through what he eats or some practice that he does. But Peter, against his better judgment, listened to these people from Jerusalem, and he acted like they were still unclean, even though they were Christians. Uh, and we know that Christians are made clean by the blood of Jesus. So Peter was really acting in a way that had reverted quite a bit. 
He was as in his actions, he was saying, Jesus blood isn't enough to clean you. You have to do these things to stay clean. You have to, you have to stay away from food and certain practices with, uh, you know, bodily fluids or, or dead people and things like that to stay clean. And it contradicted the message that Peter himself preached. Um, so this is why Paul opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. It didn't match up with uh, what he preached. Um, so we've got these key words that are key in the, in the New Testament, Gentiles and the circumcision party and the Jews. The Gentiles are everybody in the world who's not a direct descendant of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. And, uh, and uh, so the Jews is a, is a minority in the world. It's the, the direct descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. The Gentiles are all the rest. But Jesus, as you read in the book of John, Jesus came to give salvation to the whole world, not just the Jews. And in the Old Testament, God made it clear from the beginning, you are a light to show that I want to reach all the world through Abraham's family. Through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So when we think about Peter's actions here, his actions weren't lining up with what he preached. And why did he do it? It says he did it out of fear of the circumcision party. And we need to be aware of our motivations. And fear, even in us adults, and even us people who have been Christians for a long time, can still have a powerful effect in our lives. And it can compel us to do things against our better judgment. And I, I think it's important for us to be speaking the truth to ourselves and uh, be willing to receive opposition if a, if a trusted person opposes you, like Paul did to Cephas, um, to receive that and say, all right, maybe I am acting wrong and I'm doing it out of fear. We need to be aware of how fear is affecting our lives. And it shows up with, we're worried or afraid of what people might think of us, right or wrong. We might say, I'm afraid they're going to misunderstand me, so I'm not going to, so I'm not going to do this thing that I should be doing. Or you're going to say, they're going to, they're going to think I'm doing, they're going to see what I'm doing and disagree with me, so I'm just not going to do it. I don't need to do it. But we need to have courage. We need to be bold to do what is right according to God's word without worrying about what other people might think about us. And in this passage here, it was the circumcision party. Uh, Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. So it wasn't even all of the Jews. It was this, it was this subculture, this, this one, one subculture, subculture within, within uh, the, the Jewish, Jewish nation, nation who, uh, who Peter, Peter was worried, worried what they might think about him. him. And, and if, if you, you think, think about, about our lives, lives that's, that's actually a... Uh, a we. For, for some, some reason, we find that compelling. compelling. Oftentimes, but some, some, some subculture, subculture might think about us. And uh, we, as Christians, we're different from the rest of the world. And so we know the world disagrees with us, and we've got to keep that in mind that that's okay, that they think differently than us. We're following Jesus, so we're going to be different from the rest of the world. But even within the Christian community, there's different subcultures within the Christian community. And uh, I think this is similar to what Peter was going through in this passage. And we need to be courageous to follow Jesus obediently without being afraid of what certain groups of people might think about us or worry to how they'll take it. So Paul opposed Paul, uh, Peter to his face. <clears throat> and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And so he uses the word hypocrisy because they were saying one thing, but they were doing another thing. Peter preached, and thousands of people got saved. He preached salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. Salvation by grace through faith alone, nothing else. But then he started doing things that was in agreement with people that said, yeah, that's good to trust Jesus, but you also have to do these um, Old Testament requirements or else you're not one with God. And so even Barnabas was led astray. And we've got to be, this is, underscores a, an important reason why we have to be courageous and do what is right without being afraid of what others might think because 
our actions do lead others. And we have to be careful that we don't want to lead others astray. And, 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 you know, maybe we, 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 we understand in our mind, this is, you know, Peter probably rationalized. I know you're saved by faith alone, by God's grace alone, but he had some sort of rationale why he separated, but he didn't realize that he was leading other people astray by doing this. And, and uh, so Paul confronted him. He said, when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like the Jews? And so uh, Peter, Peter was not living in the way that he believed. It wasn't in step with the truth, the truth of the gospel. And amongst this crowd this morning, uh, we've got a variety of people. We've got people who are not believers, and they're coming because they're interested or they have some kind of motivation to come. And we've got people who are newer believers, and we've got people who, are, who have been believers for a long time. And this is a message for all of us. Is our conduct in step with what we believe? Now, amongst us, there are some people that have beliefs that are actually not in step with the truth of the gospel. And you're trying to hold both of these beliefs at once because you're in a process changing your ideas or you're growing in your faith. And uh, all of us need to be careful. What, what am I holding to? What am I believing? Is it matched up with the gospel? Because it... To, you know, it's, it's illogical to have two conflicting beliefs in our minds at the same time, but we can do it, and we do it sometimes. We just try not to think about it too much. And so we need to think, is there certain ideas in my mind that I, that I feel comfortable with, and I, and I hold them in my heart, but actually they're not in line with the truth of the gospel? And so we need to think about that. And then like Peter, what about our actions? Maybe my heart... My mind, I've got all the truth of the gospel firmly embedded in my heart and in my mind, but then I do things that just doesn't match up with the truth of the gospel. And it might be something as, as seemingly insignificant as, as like Peter here, not eating with somebody. You know, someone could say, what does it matter if he didn't eat with them? But Peter, uh, Paul, he saw how it affected other people around them and how it spoke to the gospel. We need to make sure our actions are in step with the gospel. And uh, Paul asked him, if you, though you're a Jew, you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like that also? So there's something to learn from this. Peter, Paul said, Peter, you are a Jew, but you do not live like a Jew. That means Peter was not following the Old Testament covenant anymore. He was living like a Gentile. He received Jesus' message that no food is unclean. He didn't feel compelled to follow all the, the ceremonies. He wasn't offering sacrifices at the temple. The temple was still there, but he, he was no longer offering sacrifices. He wasn't honoring the holy days because Jesus showed him the fulfillment of all those things. And he, he could live in the fulfillment of those. He didn't have to live in the shadow of those anymore. And he said, but your actions are compelling other people that you're expecting them to live according to the old way. But we've got a new covenant that we live by that's uh, founded on faith in Jesus Christ. And so he asked Paul this message. Uh, he asked Peter, how can you expect other people to live the way you don't even live? And now as you keep reading the passage here, uh, I think most of our Bibles probably end the quotation with the previous verse. But in verse 15, I think he may, st this, is, this is either uh, Paul readdressing the Gentiles and speaking directly to them, or to the Galatians in his letter, but it also could be him continuing to share his conversation with Peter. I think this may be partly of what he was continuing to say to Peter, where he said, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the only way that I understand this past, that what he's saying here, is that he is talking facetiously. As of now, that's the best way I can understand this. Because it doesn't make sense for him to say, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Uh, that's, a, that's 
insinuating that Jews are born Jew and not sinful, and everyone else is born Gentile and sinful. And that just doesn't match up with the rest of, the, of Paul's writings and Jesus' writing, uh, Jesus, uh, what Jesus said and Peter's writings. It doesn't match up. Uh, if he was talking to Peter about this, saying we are, you know, it's like he's saying, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Well, Peter would have remembered that Jesus himself said, you must be born again. It's not enough to be born a Jew. You have to be born again. And uh, Paul himself later on said that there is none righteous, no, not one. All are sinful, Jews and Gentiles alike. So when you think about what Jesus said and what Paul said, it doesn't, he didn't believe this statement, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. He's pointing out the silliness of what Peter was doing. Peter was acting like that was true, though Peter didn't believe it. He says, even though, the, even though some people think that there are Jews who are right with God and Gentiles who are sinful, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we Christians sometimes, we can act very similarly to the way the Jews did. Uh, we, can, we can go through testing like they did, and then we turn around and we test God instead of passing the test. Uh, we can be like the Jews where we, in the old, we read about in the Old Testament where we don't trust God and we struggle and we, fall, we follow false teachings and false practices. And I think sometimes us Christians can be like these Jews that Paul is referring to where we think, you know what? I'm in a Christian family. I grew up in the church. I'm not like those outsiders outside the church who are sinful. I'm one on the inside of the church. I'm good. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the way he's born or by what he does at all, but through faith in Jesus Christ. A person is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Us Christians, the Jews, anybody. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. By works of the law, no one will be justified. He really kind of repeats himself here, doesn't he? Look at verse uh, uh, 15. Oh, I lost my clicking ability. Can you back up one, Tori? Uh, let's look at verse, verse uh, 15 and 16. Yeah. Uh, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, that's clear. And now we'll go to the next verse so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. He's being a little repetitive here, isn't he? But he's emphasizing the importance of it. We are not justified by what we do. We as Christians might be tempted to think, I am justified by not doing these sinful things. Now, of course, God wants us to not be doing these sinful things, but that's not what justifies us. We're justified by faith in Christ. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified justified. The things we do cannot heal us. It cannot justify us. Even if I start living perfectly right now and I never sin again, all that good living that I'm going to do doesn't do anything about the sinful things that I did do in the past. We need justified and praise the Lord. We can be justified through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember that it's through faith in Jesus' blood uh, that's why we get together and we sing Jesus' praises. And it will lead to good works that we do. But we just got to always be reminding ourselves it's not because of those good works that we're saved, but we're doing those works because we have been saved. And one, one last thing I want to point out here is Paul identified Peter. His conduct was not in step with the gospel. And so what did Paul do? He confronted him, and what did he say? He reiterated the gospel very clearly. That's what he did. He reminded Peter of what Peter already knew. And that's what we need to do as we look in our lives, as we look into the mirror of God's word and we see things in our lives, we say, you know what? My, the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you and say, this conduct of yours, that doesn't match up with the gospel. Or if a friend comes and says something similar to what, what Paul said to Peter, the solution is, to remind ourselves what we already know, 
remind ourselves of the gospel once again. I know the temptation is strong to say, what do I do? I'm going to try even harder. I'm going to do better next time. But we've got to keep going back to the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And that includes me tomorrow. It, it meant me when I first believed decades ago. And it means me tomorrow when I'm confronted with a sin and I need to repent from it. I remind myself of what I already know, the, the truth, truth of, of the gospel. gospel. So well, that's, that's the, the simple, simple message this morning. This morning. And we're going to look more into that passage next week as we keep going through Paul's letter. But I just want all of us to think together. First of all, do we have beliefs that affect our practices? Do we have beliefs that are not in step with the gospel? And secondly, do we have conduct that's not in step with the gospel? And these are things we need to repent from and go back to the gospel truth. And, and just, just immerse ourselves, ourselves in that, remind ourselves of it, meditate on it, and we will find that God will straighten our paths as we do that. So let's go ahead and stand together and we'll sing a hymn.